I'm John Salmon. I'm the presider. Arthur is founder and director of the International Festival for Creative Pianists. Currently a private teacher in Boise, Idaho, Houle has taught at several higher education institutions around the country. I have been fortunate to be involved in his festival the past few years where prizes are given for most original fioritura, original fioritura or embellishment, most original eingang or dushgang, that's transition. So he thinks outside of the box, Arthur Houle. I'm going to let, to some extent, my program notes do some of the talking for me. The abstract, what I submitted for this proposal, is on the cover page. In a nutshell, unbeknownst to a lot of us today, when children and older people performed in, say, the Baroque era, a repeat sign was the same invitation to get creative and do all kinds of fun things on the second time as it would be, say, for a jazzer today. It would be unheard of for a jazzer to play uh, a lead sheet exactly the same way twice. It would be unheard of for them to even play just the notes on the page uh, of a lead sheet, even the first time. And that spirit is something that unfortunately today, classical embellishing, the classical improvisation has turned into an oxymoron. And so some of us here are on a mission to hopefully resurrect this fine tradition. My purpose today is to keep it very, very simple and very practical. Because what I find in giving this kind of presentation around the country to fledgling teachers and young people and students, intermediate level and above generally, is that there's a lot of fear of the unknown, that this is something very, very deep and mystical and difficult to do. Uh, it's really not that difficult at all. If, if you'll all turn to the second page of your handout, just a very quick where this would be most appropriate, okay, just very much in a nutshell. Generally, the farther back in history you go, the more this kind of thing was done. Also, generally, the simpler the music is to start with, the more likely you're going to mess around with it. It's very much like jazz again. If you have a very open-ended, very simple lead sheet, you're more likely to go crazy all over it than something that's already very complex. So uh, just a sort of general rule there, rule of thumb. So certainly most of the Baroque dances, especially those with repeat signs, uh, classical music, again, with repeat signs, it would have been a tradition, even in sonata forms, to, to actually do those repeats. Beethoven preferred people to actually do his repeats. And interesting little thing that you can follow up on your own online, I've posted. Schubert made 25, well, at least 25, what I like to call them fake charts. As a matter of fact, he outdid the jazzers. The jazzers, at least, are polite enough to put chord symbols in. Uh, Schubert just wrote a line of music Nothing. No left hand, no chord symbols. It's great. Uh, it's, it's great fun to figure out, you know, how to uh, deal with that. But that's a whole other lecture topic. And then, of course, in Chopin, uh, the most likely areas would be waltzes, mazurkas, and nocturnes, especially uh, the posthumous ones. Again, that, that's a different lecture. But what I'd like to get to is the, the way to go about this with students, to make it very, very digestible, break it down very easily for them. Four categories I like to talk about. The first one is really, really easy. I like to call this my Monty Python method. Are we all Monty Python fans? Okay, so when in doubt, now for something completely different. So uh, generally, when a student plays something from Anna Magdalena Bach, they're most likely to play kind of a generic mezzo piano slash mezzo forte and pretty much static. Am I wrong? I mean, most of you, that's, that's what you're gonna get the first time, aren't you? All right, so then challenge them on the repeat do something different. Either play it a whole lot louder, or maybe use the unicorda a lot quieter, or at the very least, more nuanced, some crescendos, decrescendos, think of the voice, you know, sing it, so forth. Uh, stoke their imagination. Try to either get a very clean score, or at least something like the Alfred editions, where they put respectfully the editings in light gray, and then hopefully ignore the light gray even. Uh, <laughs> but uh, something that you can work with and feel free to just desecrate with a pencil all over the place. And then erase it and start all over again. Okay, so that's the first category. Then the second category, articulation, which basically in a nutshell has to do, of course, with legato, staccato, and that third category that we're really, really fond of out here in Idaho, portados, because we really get portados out in Idaho. 
Sorry, some of you have heard that one before, so apologies. Um, and uh, of course, it also has to do with, if any of you have looked at fingering practice in the Baroque era, uh, you know, I had this neat anthology, and I've lost it, and I'm really, I'm just down crestfallen, and I can't remember the authors even who put this together, but they, they uh, collected uh, several Baroque and pre-Baroque uh, works that have authentic fingerings written in by composers. And it's absolutely fascinating to look at. Look at a handle minuet where you just simply don't cross the thumb the way you expect, you know. Uh, and you do a lot of little handfuls of jumping around. And I have students often play these pieces, if I can ever find the darn thing again. And I'll say, could you play this? And please, do nothing clever with it. Just do whatever feels natural in terms of, you know, follow the notes, follow the fingerings. But you know, we are such, today, legato chauvinist pigs. It's impossible to get students to do that. You know, they, they will just do, uh, you'll see two, three, four, and then two, and they'll contort their fingers and do any, you know, anything, that, because playing non-legato is, is, I think it's like playing naked on stage, uh, you know, for, for young people today. So it's not like one is bad or right and the other one's altogether wrong. It's not that at all. It's just opening their world to the idea that, it, we all know that, of course, up to roughly Clementi, Clement, Clementi, more than anybody, is probably the fellow who, who got us playing so much more legato and maybe late, later Beethoven, uh, and, and it really caught on. And it's wonderful. I'm, I'm not anti-legato. I'm not one of these purists who thinks that Clementi is the antichrist. You know, I'm not going to go that far. Uh, but it is fun to explore some of the older uh, practices, of course. Um, okay, so anyway, the third category, ornaments. I would start with maybe the four three or four most, most popular flavors of ornaments. What would those be? The harlequin of ornaments. The trill? What, what am I, yell it out, I can't. Mordant. The mordant, thank you. Trill, mordant, appoggiatura, gazonite. And what, what's the last one? Yeah, you guessed, okay. I like to introduce when I'm doing Chopin and I say I'm gonna do the, the nocturnes, you know, anyway, okay. Anyway, so I, I think we hit the, the, the four most popular ornaments. What would you start with with a student out of those four? What would be the easiest for them to deal with? Uh, well, aside from the name <laughs> and spelling it, uh, yes, and explaining it even, but, but yes, physically, yes, I think that would be the easiest thing to start with. Uh, the next easiest, let's see, what would be the next one? Maybe mordant, yeah. Although they're, they're supposed to be generally snappy, pretty quick. So technically, uh, I would try a lot of three, two, one now, and then, depending on the context, of course. Uh, then maybe what? Turn, maybe a slowish turn first. Of course, you can do the turn slow or uh, snappy, depending on what sounds good in a given context. And then, what did we miss? Oh yeah, trill. And of course, we know to generally start on the upper auxiliary. Probably the easiest way to introduce that would be to explain what a cadence is. How would you explain to a student what a cadence is? It's, it's a place in the music that at least feels like it's coming to an ending. It may not actually be the ending of the piece, but it has that feeling of an ending. So at cadence points, explain that the pentultimate note, the note before the resolution, sometimes the resolution note, that's screaming for some kind of an add-on uh, some sort of ornament. That's a great place to start. And we're, we're going to put you guys through the, uh, the mill very soon here. I'm going to stop talking and get some guinea pigs to come up, hopefully. Uh, okay, now the fourth category is probably the most, uh, the most challenging, but also the most fun. It's what you might call melodic, sometimes harmonic embellishment. That's actually messing around with the notes themselves the way a jazzer might. Now, this is the category that's going to really traumatize teachers. I mean, you can just see them breaking out into a cold sweat sometimes. So I like to start with what I call fill in the blanks, or of course, in, uh, inserting passing tones. So if you got a D minus in theory, you probably can do this. <laughs> Find any third in whatever piece you're looking at, say C to E. And I think even the most harmony theory challenged person out there would probably figure out that D would work really nicely. I doubt you're going to get many people making this mistake. Or, well, unless they're jazzers, maybe, yeah. 
but but you know, I mean, it's it's pretty much a gimme, uh, what, uh, how to do that. So I start with that. When you're looking at larger leaps, rather than filling in passing tones or scale patterns, that may not always work. I'll give you a for instance. Let's see what I can find here. Okay, let's let's say the D minor minuet. You'll recognize what I'm doing here. The one that starts out. <laughs> Right, this, the B section, the second part. Right, I mean, I think if you tried to do, kind of sounds like you slipped on a banana peel. Uh, wouldn't recommend that as my top choice, apart from the fact that most students wouldn't be able to play it anyway. So uh, on those larger leaps, uh, try a chord tone. Now, this is the tricky part. A lot of students, we take for granted, you know, uh, one, one of my counterparts loves to say, Virginia Willard, she's a fantastic teacher, she likes to say, you've probably heard this one before, assumption is the mother of all evil. <laughs> so never assume. You know, we look at something very simple and we know the chords or the implied chords. Sometimes we're only going to get one or two notes of, the, of what's implied there is a harmony. We probably know what's there. Let's not assume that the student necessarily does. So uh, part of this whole thing might be for them to get some training uh, separately on reading lead sheets and getting some of that jazz theory and so forth, learning all the chords so that they can apply it, believe it or not, to Baroque. I think learning jazz is a great prerequisite for doing Baroque music. And I'll give you a, a really terrific example of that. I'm just going to digress just for a second. You know, I have... I don't have a whole lot of copies here, but I have four copies of the Anna Magdalena Bach, and they're, and they're all with little post-it notes. So if at least a few of you would like to follow along who didn't bring scores, there are a few out there. If you turn to, uh, let's see, it's page 30 in the Alfred edition. It, this is a marvelous one that I, I think doesn't get taught nearly as often as it should. It's the C minor minuet. Uh, BWV Yang uh, 121. Do, you, do we all know what BWV stands for? Right? It, it's box car. Right? We, we know that? Okay. Just, just wanted to make sure you, you, you knew that. I, I have a rich appreciation for simplicity, a really good simplicity, because this thing is screening uh, implied lush harmonies, but it's so unbelievably austere in the writing. I, I think that's a gift to be able to do that. Sorry, I, I couldn't resist even first time. It, it's a disease, you know, after a while. You know, I remember years ago, I, I went to Tanglewood, and I was hearing, uh, I, I remember it was a sax player and a bass player just improvising. It's just two lines of music, single line, you know, and it hit me like a piano falling on me that I'm hearing flat nine chords and 13th chords and sharp 87ths, and I'm just kidding about that one, but, but I'm hearing these really, really lush chords, but then suddenly I'm going, but, but I'm only hearing two notes. How can that be? You know, it's, it's interesting how that works. So I think it's a fantastic exercise. Can I get my first guinea pig? Would anybody like to come up to the piano? You don't have to be a phenomenal sight reader. Come on up. I love it. Thank you. Excellent. Oh, I like your attitude. You must be a phantasmagorical teacher. Okay, sit down. And let me have you play uh, just what I played one more time. And then just for fun, I want you to see if you can fill in what you would think of as the implied chords, like the, the first beat. Oh, 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 now she's, now she's running away. But now you can, you can go. You, you, no, you don't have to be an improviser. Okay, I'll give you the first chord. It's in C minor. What do you think the first chord is going to be? Aren't I generous? You are. Good guy, aren't I? You are. I, d I did the hard part. Anyway, play maybe two bars, very slowly. Okay. okay, let's stop right there. And, and let's see if you can fill in what you think are the implied harmonies. So, in other words, keep that note on top, keep the bottom note on the bottom, and fill in where you can, like this, in the right, in the right hand. What would be the implied chord, perhaps, on under D? And what you're going to find, what's very intriguing, lest you get all intimidated, is in many, many cases, there are several possibilities. 
that's what's so fun and exciting. Mm -hmm. Possible. Good. Oh, she's cooking. Oh, this is where it gets interesting. There, 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 in many cases, there are several possibilities. Okay, now I'm going to, if I may, just for a second, thank you. We'll, we'll pick on somebody else in a bit. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm going to put on my, my nightclub hat here for a minute, and we almost should douse the lights uh, and put a tip dish here in the whole works. And, 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 it, and it's very tacky and schlocky. I'm not suggesting, kids, you do this at home or anything, but, but just for demonstration purposes. Uh, <laughs> Maybe. I know, I have an overactive, rich imagination. Uh, but I'm just making a general point that that's a fantastic sort of exercise to go through with students to, to just explore what those implied harmonies. Because obviously, if you're going to fill in, going back to that T minor example, if I'm going to do something other than this silly thing, then you know, I have to know that this is outlining what triad? F major, yeah. So it could be anything from... Maybe I just put one chord tone in. Or maybe I put two. Or maybe I go for it. And different rhythms, of course. Okay, let's, let's move along now. Let's go to the third page of your handout. I want to explain that before something awful like I run out of time happens. Are we all familiar with the English suites of Bach? Okay. This is one of those real smoking guns to me. Uh, number two and number three. I did not put number three. This is from the uh, Dover edition, the second uh, English suite of Bach, in which he demonstrates how to improvise. I mean, who better to learn from than Bach himself? He shows the, the, the simple version, and then underneath that, uh, in French, he explains that this, this is the same Sarabande with added ornaments. Now, obviously, I hope it's obvious that you would superimpose that melodic line onto the full fabric of the music up here. Do you see that? Uh, so what would originally have been just this very simple, don't you love this guy? I mean, he would have been a jazzer, let's face it. I mean, right away to put a deceptive cadence in, too, in the second, I mean, boy, this uh, anyway, so if I superimpose what he's got underneath, and now it's it's to me it's really really worth your time to take a Sherlock Holmes magnifying glass and go through this measure by measure, molecule by molecule, and analyze what he's doing. For example, that second measure, he's simply taking that uh, simple A that he had and putting a changing tone pattern around it. Uh, it's something of a turn figure. It's not exactly a turn, but... Okay, so I thought, who better to plagiarize from than Bach himself? So check out the next page of your handout, the last page. Now, I hope you can follow this, uh, just the, the upper portion of this. What I did is I took uh, that menuet in D minor, and I thought, I am going to shamelessly take some of Bach's riffs, some of his licks, sorry if I keep interjecting with jazz terminology, I can't help myself, there's such an affinity here. I'm going, to, I'm going to just steal some of his little licks and throw them into the D minor minuet. Now can you sort of follow how this is working? Now I didn't give you the, the full English suite number uh, three, but if you study that one it's even more fascinating because he's got embellishments going on, on right hand and left hand of the music. So check that out on your own as well. I've just got a very brief excerpt from there. So I'm going to play through just for fun. You all recognize, of course, the D minor menuet. It's page 26 in the Alfred editions, whoever's got that out there. And I'm going to throw in some of these shameless Bach riffs. 
I also messed around with the form, see if you can follow what I did here. section fairly straight the first time but an added ornament at the cadence point of course even the first time that's I think legit a section embellished Notice I also messed around with the left hand. Please don't be a right hand chauvinist pig. We, we, most of us are. And then now the B section, embellished. Now, don't, don't be too intimidated by that. I mean, that was one of those things. It, it, it's a little bit analogous to uh, Jay Leno, uh, how he, he, he works all night to think up those ad libs. So, I mean, that, that was kind of all uh, plotted out, more or less. Uh, but, but brings up an interesting point that um, when it comes to actually performing this sort of thing, you know, I, I get asked by students at the festival that, that John uh, adjudicates every year, is it legit? for me to sort of work out these ad-libs ahead of time. I mean, will I still get a prize for spontaneity? And my answer is always the same. If you do it really well and you fake us out, how are we going to know? So that, that's really your own judgment call to what extent you want to operate without a net and get to the point where you can just do this spontaneously, completely spontaneously, or just somewhat spontaneously, or, or you know, not just sounding spontaneous. You know, I did a little study of George Harrison's guitar solos in the Beatles songs, and it turns out they fall into three categories. There's the, I saw her standing there, for example, that song, every single time, I've got enough takes of that and outtakes, he's always uh, improvising completely, 100%. It never, there's never two, two notes alike. Other times he works out every single note, almost classically, and he plays it the same each time, and then sometimes he's kind of in between. And it's okay. Each, you know, each one can work. I would love to get another victim up here. And can we do, can you guess which one in this Anna Magdalena collection would be the all-time most popular tune ever written, probably? The G major, the infamous G major. And it's written by Christian Petzl. Let's get that right on program sheets, please. Anyway, who, who would like to be my victim for this part? Come on, you all know this. I should have about 20 hands raised here. Okay, come on up. I was about to say, do, don't just do something, sit there. <laughs> here, climb up this nice first step here. Excellent. <laughs> well, shall we go back to page two in the handout? And I'd, like, I'd love for us to put into practice some of this, just for fun. I promise to be some interactive element here, meaning I abuse the audience. So let's, let's pretend we're having a little lesson with a student who... Uh, you know, I, I found over the years, I mean I, I mean, I don't know how many of you have done this with students already, but it's not the students generally who are the, the problem. I mean, they, they're really dying to be creative with music. As a matter of fact, they're kind of stunned. You, you mean it's legal? Uh, it's okay if I do this sort of thing? You know, they're, they're rather surprised. It, it's only, you know, we, we haven't been exposed to it. Uh, so let's, let's take it step by step. Let's have you play uh, the first section and you can be fairly straight with it, and then we'll start at doing the four categories. OK. 
Okay, thank you. Uh, you notice that Mr. Petzold, I did a little research on him, I guess he was a rather uh, renowned organist, primarily contemporary of Bach. You notice he has given us some ornaments that were that are okay to do even the first time, that are written in. And at the cadence point, thank you for playing that correctly. You know, there are some Suzuki recordings, we won't name names, that still have it being played. Uh, I hope we all know that's just plain wrong. Uh, anyway, she played it very much like an appoggiatura, thank you. Uh, you know, what's interesting about that bar, by the way, is oftentimes that kind of appoggiatura can resolve on the third beat. I don't know if anybody's ever tried it that way. But it's sort of interesting because it would be resolving it at, at precisely the point where the left hand feels like it wants to move on. So I guess I agree with the resolving it on the second beat for this context. But I just wanted to point out that many times we can resolve on the third beat. Do you suppose we, we could get you to do the, the mordant in bar three? It's one of those little doohickeys. As a matter of fact, if you do uh, three, two, one, three, two, one, yeah, it'll, it'll get you out of that little cul-de-sac very nicely, won't it? Yeah. There we go. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, so I'm certainly, you know, students can do that a little more readily than we give them credit many times. Okay, what was her dynamic level? What's your name? I'm sorry. Terry. Terry. What was Terry's dynamic level, would you say, for that section? Anybody? Yeah, that, that, that twilight zone area, mezzo piano to mezzo forte. Okay, so we're going to challenge you to do something, the Monty Python method. Do something completely different. Let me, let me hear just maybe four measures, uh, as much imagination. You can either go much louder, maybe very quiet, even with the soft pedal perhaps if you like, or just a whole lot more nuanced with little contours, anything you like. Four measures. Four measures. Okay, yeah, yeah. I think I, I heard a little more oomph, and I also heard a little more contour. Fantastic. All right, let's go to category two now. Tailor this to the particular student. Some students can do a whole lot of things right away. Some students, if you get one ornament, one dynamic change, one detached note, <laughs> pull them just a little bit away from that legato chauvinist pig playing, and maybe one little passing tone, give them a big round of applause, and that, that's fine to start with. You, you have to tailor it to each student. Okay, so let's try, uh, how about articulation? Now, I noticed you were, you were fairly post Clementi legato, and that's fine. I'm going to challenge you to do some detached notes and or short two note, three note, maybe four note slurs. Anything you like. Just four bars. Now, wasn't that, you know, really, let's not just break the monotony for that second time. Who wants to hear it the same second time anyway, right? Keep the audience's interest. Fantastic. All right, you're a good guinea pig. Stay right up here. Uh, let's try something different in terms of art. I like to say with students, articulation, just in case they don't get what that means, you know. Yeah. So I can either go articulation, or I can do sort of like Jimmy Carter, my fellow American, you know, and there's not very much, uh, well, anyway. Um, Actually, I like to make Jimmy Carter. Don't, don't take that the, the wrong way. Um, so let's try, uh, in our third category, ornaments. Now, we've already got a built-in ornament at the first cadence point. So perhaps we could either change it or remove it or maybe leave it as is and try something uh, uh, on the second cadence point at the end of the 16 bars. Well, you know, a close cousin to the appoggiatura would be the trill. Can you just play these two bars right here, measures uh, three, four, four, five, six, and, uh, well, seven and eight, and see if you can change the, the appoggiatura to a trill. Ooh, she got frisky. Okay, I, I, I had in mind just 
a short one, but see, this brings up another really good point. There are, when you say trill, there are lots of flavors there that are possible. And you know what? I, wa I want to do a little therapy thing with all of you. This is something I do with students, whether it's you know any kind of creative uh, improvisation, wh whatever style. Okay, repeat after me. Improvisation means never having to say you're sorry. <laughs> it's really good therapy. Do this a lot with your students, okay? Because, you know, they're going to sit there all paralyzed that <gasps> it might not come out right, whatever that is, or tasteful, whatever that is. And the only way you're going to get some creativity out of the students, you give yourselves and them permission to experiment and to, you know, admit that maybe nine out of ten things you do with the keyboard, you're going to go, ew, I don't ever want to hear that. That's not a keeper. But that's the way you, you keep exploring and you find your voice, so to speak. Okay, well, let's try a different thing. How about the last two bars of that section? I just had a thought. How about a delayed resolution? That's one we haven't tried yet. For fun, Throw in one of these things. Oh, she caught on. I love it. <laughs> By the way, you know, since you're all teachers here, probably, I'll give you a couple of really cute things. When, when students miss a tie, if you're male and happen to be dressed formally, this works very nicely. If you're not, I have a Dilbert doll, a stuffed Dilbert doll that's wonderful, and it has the upturned tie, everything, and I just sort of wave it in their face. Okay. And if they miss a rest, all right. You just grab the music. Some of you maybe know this all, one already. You're under arrest. Anything you play may be used against you. You have the right to remain silent. You know, I, it's gotten to the point, it's this Pavlovian thing with my students where if they see me even do like, the, oh, I know, I know, stop it, you know. I don't even have to, just, I just start to nudge towards the music. Okay, let's try a little bit of the... Uh, Melodic embellishment, and we're going to take this very slow, like I said, gingerly, baby steps, just let's do some fill in the blank, small intervals, let's start with thirds, and don't look at only just the uh, right hand, let's look at the left hand as well. Can you find me some melodic thirds that are just screaming for passing tones? You got it. I was thinking the same measure. She just pointed, one, two, three, four, five, six, uh, seventh measure. Go ahead and throw in some passing tones there. Okay, so, you know, you could have made a little compound ornament there out of it, right? Hold the appoggiatura for a little bit and then do your... I think that's where you were going for. Yeah, yeah good for you. Yeah, with or without a tie, right? It's all kinds of compound ornaments you can do as well. Okay, and, you know, she could have done, Terry could have done the first and not the second, or the second and not the first. How about if he did the same thing but alter it rhythmically? Okay. Possibly, you know, and we may not like everything. Maybe we discard it and say I'm not sure about that, but it's just fun to explore. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Another round of applause. Okay, I may come back to that time permitting, but I'd like to move on to the inventions. Are you all familiar with that wonderful Alfred edition of the inventions? How many of you have that? So you may already be familiar with number one. You know, John and I have given very similar presentations on this, unbeknownst to each other, even before we met, I think. It, we've been just on eerily parallel tracks with this. Apparently Bach, probably Bach, penciled in a whole bunch of passing tones into that first invention. So for those of you who are not familiar with it, the original, right? And by the way, you could also tie that ornament. Uh, winds up signing, sounding like a sort of delayed mordant or, or, or something, but or an inverted mordant but delayed or whatever. Then Bach pencils in later. A little tricky getting the ornament with that, but in any case, that, that's what he did. So that got me wheels turning in several directions. First of all, must the rhythm necessarily be the same throughout? I realize that some purists might take issue with what I'm about to do. 
It probably violates one or two commentators of the day, although my, my escape clause there would be that I think that um, every succeeding generation has a right to at least to some degree redefine what we consider to be good taste. So I'm going to use that as my escape clause, even though it might be technically a little bit wrong. Besides, it's fun. So I'm going to try uh, changing the rhythm as I, I play along. And, and be, be, you taunted me into this next thing. Uh, John played it one day and introduced, let's just say, some extra measures, and, and I, because I don't want to give it away. So I'm going to play through the entire invention now. You can blame a combination of, uh, who is it, Chick Corea and uh, 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 what's his cohort on that Mozart uh, recording? Uh, um, uh, Bobby McFerrin, thank you. You can, you can blame them and, and John for inciting that little riot there. But, but, but seriously, you know, if you read the introduction by Bach, uh, how he describes the inventions, read the full introduction. It's one of those long-winded endless German sentences that you get to the verb about three years later with a million commas. But sincere instruction in which lovers of keyboard music, and especially those desiring to learn to play, are shown a clear way, not only one, to learn to play cleanly in two parts, but also after further progress, two, to proceed correctly and well with those three obligato parts, and at the same time, not only to compose good in inventions, ah, that's the part, See, there, there's a real hint of, you know, getting inventive with it. This is to show you how to do this kind of thing. Don't just slay the notes that, that are in front of you, in other words, and to develop them well and so forth and so on. And I also like that part about cantabile style, because it certainly kind of hints that he's a bit more of a romantic, maybe, than we want to give him credit, perhaps. Well, anyway, the other thing I was thinking now, let's talk about the other inventions. Now, I was thinking about number 14, how many of you agree that this invention probably started out like this? It could very well. No? Yeah, and can you see Bach at the, pian uh, at the keyboard, rather, at, at the harpsichord or clavichord or whatever? Gee, it needs something. <laughs> You know? Ah, there it is. 
okay, now I can come to dinner, you know. Can you just imagine that little scene? So I was thinking about that number one, how we added it, the little, you know, little add-on uh, passing tones, and the likely development of this number 14. So let's go now to number 13, the A minor. I'm going to play number 13 and just imagine for a moment Bach in a frisky fit of improvisation, possibly applying those same ideas to this invention. <laughs> run out of time, in the complete Anna Magdalena, and I think the, the Alfred edition as well, they, they, he also includes, kind of recycles some material here, the uh, famous C major prelude that's, of course, also in the, the uh, ill-tempered Ill clavicle, uh, I mean the well-tempered uh, clavier, uh, uh, number one, right? And I'd like to talk about this, this type of Baroque piece just a little bit, because this is, of course, a great one to talk about harmonies. That's all it is, really. If you look at uh, the way these things are even notated originally in the autographs, it's really, I, I should just pass this article around, and you can see in uh, Bach's own handwriting on the bottom just a series of chord progressions. And by the way, my students don't get to play a piece like this until they can fake it as a, as a chord chart, you might say. In other words, they, they need to be able to play it as a chorale, uh, and, and musically, like this. You know, if you do that with a student, there, there might be a fighting chance that they hear some phrasing, some contour, the fact that this is a 5-7 resolving, it's a strong weak, etc. As soon as they get involved with noti, 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 it's going to go right out the window. Right? We all have that, that same experience, so I think it's very important that they get that feeling first so that it, it might turn into music when they're done. And it's the same thing with a lot of other t pieces like this. Even, even Chopin was following this kind of model. Uh, be able to do that first before you then maybe do. And then finally, little building blocks. Uh, anyway, but that, that's a little side note. Um, it occurred to me that if you look at the evolution of this kind of piece, uh, for example, uh, in the Clefe of Buchlein, we have that little prelude in C major. The first version is this, we all recognize. Uh, and again, have students love it. And you're going to get your expression from that, that kind of thing. Uh, and then what's fascinating is towards the end where he gets into his little improvisation uh, uh, lead in cadenza type thing, really. Uh,
Now, the second version, interesting how this all evolves. You know, so, and, and we have actually some, you know, some very ornate ornaments added on. And then the, the whole lead in cadenza is completely reworked. It's unrecognizable from the first time. Uh, thinking of the implications of this kind of thing, then the prelude number 10 in uh, uh, WTC number, uh, uh, book one, now I, sh I should point out that's the first version, which really shows up again in the Klaffee book line. And what does he do with it? I mean, it's a series of just, just this little pattern and just simple chords, and that's all he has in the first version. And then he goes nuts on the, on the, in, in the final version. I mean, he turns it into this glorious arioso. You know, I might be the only person who's a bit of a dissenting voice about, you know, you're all familiar with the Ave Maria that was built on this, and, and it's fashionable to be terribly revulsed by this sort of thing. And, and you know, I'm just going to put it out there that maybe, just maybe, Bach himself might have been the last person to be offended by that. Well, because if you look at the kind of things he does with his own music, he's constantly reworking things like that. Anyway, so I'm going to just put this out there. I know it's about five minutes, right? Okay. I'm going to play through this prelude, and I, I needed to find a way to do the repeat. To save time, I'm going to, I'm going to say, let's pretend I played through most of this already, and I'm going to do, just repeat the entire form, because I needed an excuse to do this kind of thing. <clears throat> so here it is. Okay, we, we just played through the first time. I'm about here, towards the end. Very, very quickly, because I know we're running out of time here, and I want to have a couple of minutes for questions, perhaps. This little digression I did, it's probably all through you. 
that's an authentic variant that shows up in a different source. Uh, this one's dubious, I realize. But I only did it the second time anyway. Uh, and of course, changing the pattern, well, you know, again, you look at how he messes around with his own works. Is it really so outrageous that maybe he might have diddled around and tried different patterns from time to time? Do we really think he's so sterile and bereft of ideas that he would have played religiously every single time only this one pattern? So I just throw that out there that, uh, you know, hopefully we can look at music this way. Do we have any questions, uh, tomatoes, time delayed bombs, anything that, uh, yes? Well, well, you know, see, that's a loaded question because I think you, you, no, seriously, you have to ask the people who are coordinating those kinds of various festivals and guilds and so forth what the ground rules are. Uh, I mean, people will ask me, are my students actually going to be disadvantaged? Sadly, sometimes, yes. Now, my festival, are you kidding? Come on down. They'll be encouraged. Hopefully, we'll come to a day where all these venues will encourage that kind of thing. I hope. Yes. Well, you know, that, that's a fantastic, thank you so much for bringing that up because, of course, all the treatises of the, of the day talk about the balancing of freedom with good taste. But, but the other thing that's interesting about all those treatises is as much as they're trying to define good taste, they're always a little bit gingerly about it. If you really read between the lines, they're essentially saying, you know, these are just some examples of what good taste is. You know, and we tend to take it like biblical fundamentalist text that, you know, this is it. And I think we have to be a little bit careful. Uh, I mean, it is a, 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 a tricky thing. You know, there are times when, yeah, you're going to have to just kind of very gingerly say to a student, well, that was interesting. Uh, maybe that's not a keeper, but I really applaud that, you know, we're, we're exploring. Um, and, and, it, and, and I admit that some of that is going to be a bit subjective. We're going to have, you know, we're going to agree to disagree. Yes? Maybe you improvise with a piece that don't act like it. Like number eight, um, like the story in Chicago where everything is just flowing without stopping. Number eight, uh, the invention? Yes. I don't know. I, I have to think about that one. Possibly. You know, if you can work it out in a tasteful, uh, discreet, logical way where we, when you do it here, maybe you do it here as well. Yeah, I'm open. I'd love to hear it a little differently. Wouldn't bother me. It could go both ways, absolutely. Chopin, we know of instances where sometimes something was very complex and he'd go the other direction now and then. Usually the more complex direction, but it can, it can be both directions perhaps, yeah. We're run out of time. Thank you so much, everybody.